I want to give you a little context for why we selected the phrase, what is a library? Um, I, I was a librarian for about 40 years, and I worked in about 40 different libraries through that career. Um, throughout that time, I love to ask the question to all kinds of people, what kind of groups, what comes to your mind when I ask you, what's a library? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? And through the years, I've heard all kinds of responses. I'll give you a sample. A great place to find a date. I found my <laughs> wife here. Uh, walking into an attic full of treasures. Shushing librarians. <laughs> Older folks often remember losing their library privileges because they talked too loud in the library. <laughs> or worse, didn't return their books on time. Girl. At the library dedication at Augustana College, where I was working, uh, the college president addressed the audience uh, by saying that the library was the living room of the college. And he was very quick to add, but not the rumpus room. <laughs> so some people think of the library as a physical place, the bricks, the mortar, a physical place that's inviting and comfortable, and some people like it to be grand. For some, the intellectual experiences are what make a library. It's a place where the stories of the world can be found by many voices through a, a variety of resources. It's a place where senses and thoughts are constantly sparked by serendipitous discoveries. And for some, it's the community interaction that takes place in a library that's the keystone of what the library is. It's a place where people of all ages and backgrounds can come together to collaborate on projects, discuss ideas, or explore with each other the fun of learning. Well, through my life, I have learned that a library is a very complex place. So we brought this panel of extraordinary people together to hear their perspectives on what is a library. And that was all the guidelines we gave them, really. Uh, Scary, scary question. Um, let me introduce. Uh, this is Catherine Delaney. No, wait a minute. Say it again. Delneo. Delneo. I told you I was bad at that. <laughs> she is the new uh, Vermont State Librarian and Commissioner of Libraries. She just recently came back to Vermont from uh, working at San Francisco Public Library. Whoa. Stephen J. Gross over here is a writer. He recently wrote an op-ed entitled, Ilsley welcomed me for co-working in the Addison Independent. Steve was recently elected to the Ilsley Library Board of Trustees. Grace Viney is a senior at uh, Millbury Union High School. She is off to Bard College in the fall and told me she attributes libraries for the framing of her life. Might be my words, not your words. <laughs> Jim Gish, we all know him. He's our community liaison with the town of Middlebury. He's credited by all for getting us through the railroad crisis with a smile. <laughs> Jim has also served as president of the Board of Trustees of Ilsley Library and also served on the Vermont State Library Board. And of course, last but certainly not least, Dana Hart, our Ilsley Library Director since 2018. Dana was formerly manager of library administration for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Each of these panelists will speak for no more than 10 minutes, they promised me, and then we'll open it up to the audience. What is a library from your perspective? So we'll start with Catherine. I've got my phone here the with the timer on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me here. I'm thrilled to be back in Vermont, and I used to travel down to Middlebury every week of my life in middle school and part of high school for cello lessons. Never got into this beautiful building before, or been in the library with you all, but I'm really glad to be here tonight. Um, I want to start out thinking about my memory of libraries. What are libraries to me? I think a lot of us have a nostalgia in our minds for libraries. Um, when I think of the library of my childhood, it's, it's just I close my eyes and I see books. There are books everywhere. There are floor-to-ceiling books, wall-to-wall books, 
books for kids, books for teenagers, books for adults. There's fiction, there's nonfiction. I don't read it, but there's biography. There's something for everybody, just tons and tons and tons and tons of books. And then as I try to focus in a little bit more, other elements start to appear. I am from an era that I remember the card catalog, just as many of you do. I remember the handwritten notes. I remember the typed information. Um, sometimes the italicized type information, which I wondered how one made. All of those details, the smell of it, all of that just resonates in my, in my mind. And just for me, I start just feeling happy, warm thoughts. For me, visiting the library as a kid, we tended to go on rainy days. So my imaginary library is, it's probably rainy and it's even that much more cozy to be snuggled in with my books sitting in the library while my dad just sits there at the microfilm machine for hours <laughs> and hours and hours. Um, I, in this kind of memory of a library, the people are at the circulation desk and they might whisper their question so from a very young age, I knew that there was a privacy about the library, that we came to this space and we could ask anything we wanted. We could look at any of the books we wanted to see, and we could get help finding things that we might not even know we needed when we showed up. The librarian was always giving us secret treasures when we would visit the library, extra books that we hadn't really asked for that she knew that she would like ended up in our checkout pile. Those pieces of guidance and that information was so important. Um, in my memory, there's a reverential, hushed, and muted tone to the library. And everybody is really intent on their activities. But remember, this is my memory, and our memory may not be real. So coming into the present, having spent so many years now working in public libraries, first in New Jersey, then in San Francisco, different public libraries, different types of libraries, um, I've worked in an art library, I've worked in the ILL department, I've had college library experiences, thinking about all of them, they're a lot more vibrant and bustling when you're really in the library. They're a lot louder. Um, there's a lot more going on. I think that um, in our libraries, we often see people clustered together, talking about whatever it is that they're learning about, just sharing news of the day, chatting with each other. So I definitely feel like the library is a space where we can get together as a community. And we might be sharing, we might think we're sharing really lofty thoughts, but sometimes we're just gossiping. Sometimes we're asking a, a question of, of a friend, um, making plans to meet up later. But we also see a lot of people using technology in today's public libraries. We see people searching on the computer. We see people looking in the catalog. And we also continue to see people touching physical print items. We see people touching the newspapers. I look around here and I see the newspapers and I can imagine in the morning, multiple people want to read the same newspaper. The newspaper is often a really prized possession in the library. Thinking about in San Francisco, our Chinatown branch, we had to buy multiple copies of the newspaper. People wanted it so much, they would fight if we did not give them all of, all of them their own copy. Um, so today's libraries, we are using technology more than in the past, but we also still hold on to those print materials. And then we've got all of these other things. Going downstairs, we saw ukuleles on the wall. I heard about an e-bike that's coming soon. There are all different things that are checked out in our, in our vibrant public libraries today. And I think Vermont's really embraced that more than even some other areas have in the country where I just get the sense that every, we've only been to four libraries. I've only been here about a month, and I've been to today four libraries. But at each of them, they were circulating something I didn't expect. And so that was really kind of a delight. I thought they were circulating pool noodles at one library, but they were not. That was part of a field day event that they do periodically. Um, but the great thing today is we have the library here together with the books and the books that we check out. And then we also have more options. We have e-resources, we have movies and music and all sorts of things that we can share together and then connect with each other around. But still for me, that idea that we might look at something by ourselves, but at the library we might have a discussion, we might have a conversation, we might visit and have a program. Um, I saw the meeting room downstairs that I could just imagine it filled with people and they would all be engaged in learning about something or making something or doing something. Um, 
And I think about some of the amazing libraries that I've seen across the country. I was telling my colleague, Tom McMurdo, who also works at the State Library with me, um, I was telling him about how I kind of go on vacation to look at other libraries, and when I'm at conferences, I slip away to look at all of the libraries. And I've seen so many libraries across the country, and there are things that are common to all of them. And then there are special things that some libraries have that others don't. I saw a library in Colorado that was a converted, I guess it was like a Verizon office building, and they had so much space, and so they could do all of the things that we might want to do, things that you actually do here in some ways. You've got the TV studio upstairs with the partners. They had, they had I think, multiple maker spaces, and then they had a TV studio and a recording studio, and all of these different things. I think we're going to see more of that in the future. Um, and I do think it's really tough to predict what, what will carry forward from libraries. But I just want to share sort of when we ask people throughout the country, what do you think of the library? They think that the library is a trustworthy source of information. Hmm. They think it's a reliable source of information. We are living at a time when it's really tough to know if what you're reading is real. And there's even more of a place for our libraries to help, to, to really be an intermediary for the staff at the library to help you find good quality information from reputable sources. I think that that is something that I really hope carries forward with libraries and that I want us all to think about when we think about libraries. Um, for me, privacy is really important when I go to the library. I remember trying to check out books when I was a kid and finding Maybe my parents had told the librarian not to check that book out to me. Yeah. I would have preferred to check out some of those books. So for me, I really think that, that when we go to the library, being able to, to use whatever resources we want, having privacy, and the ability to pursue whatever we feel like pursuing, having intellectual freedom, having that ability is really, really key. Um, and I think for me, libraries have shown themselves to be places that people turn in, in times of crisis, when we think about the COVID-19 emergency, libraries didn't disappear because that people couldn't come inside. They first did library service at the front door. They brought the books outside. They found ways to go to people remotely. The virtual and the hybrid programming really took off. So I think for me, a library is, is a comfort in a time of crisis and a source of information and a source of um, recreation and a source of learning and a way to get outside of our tiny houses or tiny apartments, a way to connect with other people in the community, even at a time when we can't maybe be in the same room with them. Um, here in Vermont, I've been learning about things libraries have done. I've heard about a library that um, in Bakersfield, there was a drought and the people would come with water jugs and fill up their water jugs at the library. I mean, that's how central to our lives the library is for so many of us. And um, I, I think that that's really important. So when I think of libraries, for some people, they're a lifeline. There are people that I used to see every day at the library that I managed in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood in San Francisco. And when there was a heat emergency, we would call them. We would check on them. How are you doing? That, that kind of glue that holds our communities together, for me, that, that is what a library is. So. Um, yeah, I have 30 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, bravo. It's normally very dangerous to give uh, an old professor the floor. <laughs> but I timed this, and I think it'll take four minutes. <laughs> Out of respect to you all, how are you? All right. So I changed the question just a tiny bit, and the question I posed to myself was, what does the Ilsley Library mean to me? For some reason, this question made me think of a famous ballad recorded by the great Paul Robeson in 1947, entitled, The House I Live In. The song opens with this question, what is America to me? Early on in the song is the phrase, a certain word, democracy. And the song ends with the line, but especially the people, that's America to me. These lines are easily applied to a free public library, such as the Ilsley, 
because it provides an enlightened democratic space for the people. And that means all of the people in our community. That is why, as a writer facing a looming book deadline and a dwindling sense of the possibility of ever meeting that deadline, that's the truth, I was able to find a commodious place where I was not only tolerated, but where I actually belonged. And of course, that place was here at our town's library. Think of how few places there are like this in our world, where you belong simply by showing up. I cannot tell you how nurturing it was to find such a place. The tables and chairs and outlets and Wi-Fi all helped, of course. But as the song said, it is especially the people, and I mean the great staff of friendly professionals and the patrons they helped, that made such a difference to me. The hard work of writing remained the same, of course, but nearly everything else was better. Instead of too much aloneness, I was amidst lots of people from our community. Some were studying, some chatted quietly with friends, while others got help with schoolwork. Our purposes varied, but we shared a common space as co-workers. That lifted my spirits and started me on a new, more productive part of my writing journey. And here's the result. <laughs> already hooked this book. Sorry. <laughs> My book deals with the ways that educators can work with rather than be bowled over by turbulence. Being able to come here regularly certainly helped to stabilize me and at a challenging time, thereby reducing the turbulence I felt to a manageable level. And here's something powerful that I found along the way. When I became a co-worker at the Ilsley, I helped to grow this community hub by connecting with others in a democratic space. The chance to connect and share, of hoping to add just a bit to the way we see and experience this world at such a turbulent time is a privilege and a gift. Finding a place where, where that can happen is a rare discovery, and that discovery is what the Ilsley means to me, a space where we can belong, create, learn, and share. I am deeply grateful. Thank you. years old. Walking into my elementary school library is like walking into another world. The shelves nearly reach the ceiling, filled with stories, most of which I've never even heard of. I've never been a big reader before. I have a visual processing disorder, and my eyes perceive letters and words at different speeds, making it hard for me to concentrate. In fact, before today, I had never willingly been to a library on my own before. My school librarian smiles down at me and asks me if I need help looking for anything in particular. I say no, because I honestly have no idea what I'm looking for. So I browse around for a little while, already a bit bored and disoriented, and almost ready to give up before something catches my eye. A bright blue paperback featuring two young kids writing on the backs of sea creatures. The title of the story was The Magic Treehouse Series, Dolphins at Daybreak. I pick up the book and look at the back. The story is of these two siblings, Jack, age 8, and Annie, age 7, who go on fantastical quests in this magic treehouse in a forest near their home. Every time they go to the treehouse, which has a library inside of it, they're transported to a different location or a different moment in time. So far, they've been to medieval England, the age of the dinosaurs, ancient Egypt, the Amazon rainforest, and in this adventure, they travel in an underwater submarine accompanied by dolphins and a giant octopus. I check the book out and bring it home, and I read it all in one sitting. I'm enraptured by the story and the way that my imagination can take me to places I've never even been. This feeling I just know for certain I'll remember for the rest of my life. A wanderlust of sorts, but I never even had to leave my room. Because just like Jack and Annie, I can go on magical adventures too. And over the next few months, I read all of the published Magic Treehouse books out there and I eagerly await each upcoming addition to their adventures. I'm 12 years old. Middle school started a couple of months ago and all of my friends are obsessed with the Percy Jackson series. I pick the first book up from my local library and find myself laughing out loud on nearly every other page. Percy has made me feel seen as a middle schooler. All of the weird new aspects of life, the struggles of locker combinations, the rapid changes in height and shoe size. Percy knows what it's like to not fit in at school. Percy knows what it's like to feel like your best friend in the world is your mom. He gets it. He gets me. 
Sometimes I feel too nervous in between my classes to talk with my peers, or I just need some time to myself, so I turn to my books. When I feel like I can't express myself, I know that my books will get it. I know that my favorite characters will understand me. From Percy Jackson to Harry Potter to the Wings of Fire series to a series of unfortunate events, I can lose myself in these tales of fantasy and dragons and wizardry in a way that makes me feel as though I've lived a thousand lives through the stories I've read. Through my hardest times, through life's scariest moments, my books were always there to comfort me and to make me feel understood. That connection is irreplaceable. I'm 16 years old. The coronavirus pandemic has just begun, and for the first time in my life, I can't go inside the library. I can't walk into the young adult section and check out half a dozen books. I can't examine the shelves for new releases. I can't spend an afternoon sitting on the floor by my favorite stories, truly at peace. And in those first weeks of March of 2020, like so many people and so much of the world, I was at a loss for purpose. Where do we go from here? How am I going to pass the time? We'd never experienced, or at least I'd never experienced anything like this in my lifetime. And as always, I turned to books. Books gave me my love for the world. They gave me my hope for the future and my hope for myself. Books let me laugh and cry when I need to. Books let me experience a million different perspectives and live in a million different places, even when I can't leave my house. Thankfully for Libby, the online library service that I quickly discovered during quarantine, I was able to check out ebooks and audiobooks for free as much as I, as much as I liked. But the, the physical aspect of reading, the ability to trace my favorite quotes with the tip of my finger and hold the story in my hands, has been taken away. I use my birthday money to get Kindle books or buy books whenever I can, but I miss the library every day. I am 18 years old. I recently declared my entrance into Bard College, a small liberal arts school in Rankliff, New York, where I plan to major in literature. I read every chance I get, and I go to my high school library to check out new books nearly every week. When I feel sad or lost, I turn to books. When I need advice, I turn to books. When I need a good cry, I turn to my favorite books. <laughs> and I'm lucky enough to be able to buy paperback books with my allowance or read on my Kindle, but not everyone has that privilege. The ability of libraries to provide reading for people, especially young people, in need of inspiration and community, free of cost, is one of the aspects of life that I am most grateful for and that I believe to be so important. Nothing to me feels as special as checking out an unreasonable number of books from my local library, <laughs> carrying them home in my arms, and tear ranking the ones I need to read first in order of priority on my bedroom floor. <laughs> books are my sanctuary and my truest love, and I will be forever grateful to that very first library in second grade that bought me the Magic Treehouse series for sparking my love of reading and for allowing me entrance into the safe haven that is books. What is a library, you ask? To me, a library is home. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, right? Yeah. Well, Art's very fortunate to be welcoming you as a student. Thank you so that. much. Sure. Wow, it's great to be here tonight in front of a lot of friendly faces. That wasn't always the case in my last gig. <laughs> <laughs> but we made it, didn't we? Yeah. Um, well, it's really nice. I was really pleased to be invited to speak uh, tonight. And I'll. Uh, um, when I started thinking about tonight's topic, you know, what is a library to me, I realized that um, I love the idea of a library as much as I love the physical space um, that gives a library its magic. And like most of you here tonight, uh, I came to libraries as a kid. And uh, today, and my wife and I are washed with books. Everywhere in the house you turn, there are books. Um, but when we were young, nearly everything we read came from the library, right? Uh, and those books opened up to us a world of imagination. They opened up a way of imagining the world around us when you're young. And you found those books at the library. You know, that, that was kind of the starting point of things. Um, I can still picture the exact spot on the shelf at the Westfield, New Jersey Public Library where I discovered a book on Fort Ticonderoga uh, and the exploits of Rogers Rangers during the French and Indian War. Um, and one of those wonderful, kind of unexpected turns in life, I ended up as an adult moving close to Lake Champlain, and for the past 20 years we've been active members of the Fort Ticonderoga Association and frequent visitors to the fort. 
So you could say that uh, my childhood experiences in the library kind of foreshadowed my life as an adult in kind of a, a very uh, positive and fun way. Later on, libraries became a place to research school papers, and that meant learning the ins and outs of card catalogs that Catherine mentioned before, and the Dewey Decimal shelving system. <laughs> well, that was no easy task, right? <laughs> uh, one of my summer jobs while attending Swarthmore College was to update the college's card catalog. And while accessing information digitally now is second nature, I really love the feel of those cards and those special sh desks or shelves that, that held them, right? They, they were just, uh, they're works of art in their own way. Uh, and then as life went on, um, libraries became the place to introduce um, my children to the joys of reading. Uh, shortly after we moved to Middlebury in 1998, my son Jack and I inaugurated what we came to call Lives Night. Um, so back then, Ilsley was open on Tuesday and Thursday night uh, till 8 o'clock, you may remember that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so most Tuesday nights after dinner, Jack and I would uh, grab our books and head over to the library and uh, camp out for a couple of hours until the announcement came over at the PA, I think usually from Jan Lyon saying, attention please. Ilsley Library will be closing in 10 minutes. Please bring your materials to the front desk. Do <laughs> we still do that, Dana? I've never used the PA system, <laughs> but I do know we have one. <laughs> that was our single time to go, but we usually got a couple of, you know, a couple of good hours in there. It was fun. We'd wander. Jack would wander here, and I'd wander there. And, you know, it was just time together in, in this really cool space. So. Um, um, and then as Isley Public Library was celebrating its 75th birthday in 1999, I had an opportunity to serve as chair of the Board of Trustees for four years. That was a great experience and I was really honored to be able to do that. And then thanks to my friend David Clark over here, <laughs> um, I was then asked to serve on the Vermont State Library Board, which I did for another seven years. So, you know, another great opportunity for me. But that time gave me an appreciation for of the real world challenges of running a library or a library system in the case of the, our state. Um, in other words, I learned kind of what it took to create that library magic, mm -hmm. right? And this is, this is the real world stuff of money and all the challenges that come with it. Um, but it also, you know, helped me think about libraries as a resource that can serve the community in a lot of different ways. And uh, according to the needs of the times, you know, times change. And according to the needs of people, people change over time too and what they're looking for in a library. Um, during that time, one of the most consistently discussed issues at the state level was broadband. And you know, the idea of creating this seamless digital pathway between our libraries and their communities, that's a pretty nifty idea, right? And I think we saw the uh, value of it during the pandemic. And it's interesting for me to think back so this was 25 years ago. It's interesting for me to think back to, you know, think ahead 25 years and think, well, what will the digital Ilsley experience be like in 25 years from now? We know what it is today. What will it be like in 25 years? I think that's fascinating. Um, but for me, it will always be about the physical space. Right, you look around here. This is a really great space here um, that uh, Colonel Ilsley gave us all those years ago. Um, this is the library, you know, a place that's full of books, uh, books waiting to be discovered, to be read, and to become part of our lives. So, um, Joe mentioned Osley 100 project team before, and you'll probably be hearing more about that if you haven't already. But, but I'm committing my time to serving on the Osley 100 project team because I believe, um, like as was said before, in the idea of the Osley Public Library and its importance to our community. Um, during the six years I spent as community liaison for a downtown construction project, you know, I got to see firsthand what a difference it makes when people take time or find the time to get involved in their community. That, you know, to me, that was what made all the difference in the success of this project was your involvement, the community's broad involvement in this. We all did it together, right? So I'm really looking forward to working with the people of our town to envision Ilsley's future as a physical building and as a library. So, thank you very much.
<laughs> well, thank you so much to all my co-panelists. I really enjoyed hearing everyone's different answers to the question, what is a library? A very unfair question to ask a librarian, I think, because um, when I first heard the prompt from Barbara, of course, uh, I thought to myself, well, great, this is my chance to have a captive audience and list out everything we do here. Um, but of course, that would far exceed my 10-minute time. So I'm not going to do that. Um, and the benefit of going last is that uh, many of the things which, I'm, which, I didn't, which I won't have time to talk about have already been mentioned by everyone else. So what I'm going to do instead is reflect on, uh, I picked out three specific um, experiences I've had in a library throughout my life that have been really significant to me. And then at the end, I'll try and kind of pull them together into a coherent answer to that question. Um, the first really significant experience I had in the library was when I was in middle school. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, and we would go to the public library every week. And um, this public library had uh, a program where middle schoolers could start volunteering to shelve books. So I got to shelve books maybe two hours a week. My mom would drop me off and pick me up. And it was really fun. Uh, the librarians would tell me what to do and set me up with my, you know, my row of books or my, my cart. And uh, I would get to work by myself, which I loved. But it was a really big deal because if you cast your mind back to your own teenage years, it is tough to get your first paying job. Really, really tough to get a job if you have zero experience. So when I got to high school a few years later, I was able to put on my resume, it was the only thing I could put on my resume, um, that I had worked independently and taken direction um, and been successful at that at the library. And I was able to list the librarians there as my references. Um, and it got me my first paying job, which of course leads to your next paying job, which sets you up for a, a career eventually. So at that point in my life, um, the library was a space for workforce development and sort of job training. I didn't think of it that way at the time. I just enjoyed being at my, um, my library and feeling like an adult. But, um, but now that I am a librarian, I understand that libraries play that role for a lot of young people. Um, we give them their first volunteer opportunity or we give them their first job. And here at Ilsley, we hire maybe two or three um, high school students each fall. And it's a job that requires no prior experience. So that's their, their entryway into, into the workforce. Um, a few years later, I had another really significant personal experience in a library. My high school English class went to the Hemingway Archive at the Kennedy Center. Um, and we were all able to work with an original manuscript, which is just so cool. You know, when you're in high school, you, you don't do a lot of original research. Um, and I was able to sort of read uh, one Hemingway short story across several different drafts and, and see how his, his work evolved. Um, and it was a major inspirational moment for me because it allowed me to, to understand reading as not a passive experience. I kind of realized for the first time what original research can look like and that engaged reading can, can lead to research, which can lead to an insight, uh, which can lead to a contribution to a field. Um, and so that is really what set me on my path uh, to study English literature as an undergrad. Um, so at that point in my life, uh, the library was really an inspirational space um, and one that kind of allowed me to, to picture myself um, contributing to a field, um, an academic field for the first time. And then recently, um, I had an experience in a library which I never really expected I would have. Um, my home library is the Lincoln Library. I don't go there a lot because I'm here every day. Uh, so my work library meets most of my library needs. But um, many of you know I have a one-year-old daughter at home, and she recently started crawling. Well, six months ago, she started crawling. And it kind of happened like that. One day I could put her down and she would stay. And then those of you that have children or nieces or nephews know, you know, the next day, they're all over the place. Um, and it happened quickly, and Wilder and I did not child-proof our home. So we had sharp corners and um, uncovered outlets and hardwood floors, which she was just slipping all over, and it was really chaotic and stressful. Um, and it occurred to me that the Lincoln Library's Children's Center is basically just a big, square, carpeted space. So we threw her in the car, we took her down to the library, and we just let her go. And it was such a relief, it was amazing. Uh, she crawled around, she was safe, she met other little kids. Um, 
we didn't have to worry about her bumping into stuff, and we watched her really conquer this milestone in front of her eyes. Um, and of course, we got to meet some other parents and, and chat, and that was wonderful too, to forge that social connection. And we're going back a little bit more now, again, as she starts to walk. So at this particular moment in time, um, the library is a, a place for my daughter to practice her gross motor skills, I guess. And it's not, um, it's not a library use that I studied in library school. <laughs> Which is a phrase that I use. Many librarians say that. It's kind of a thing. It's like, I didn't study this in library school. They're like, they didn't tell me about this one. And it's because we offer such a breadth and depth of, um, of services and facilities and resources. Um, and I think that taken together, that kind of provides an answer to what a library is, which is it's a constant in our lives. The library is always there for us, um, but it's always changing. Um, it has whatever we need at that particular moment in our life. Um, and this is true, you know, in kind of small ways, I guess. Like, no one really knows how much they need a library until they're in downtown Middlebury really needing a public bathroom or uh, to charge their cell phone. But those are needs, and the library appears when you need us in that way. Um, and of course, it's true in really significant lifeline kind of ways, as Kathy mentioned. Um, we all hope we never need to use the library to um, stay warm in winter or, or to get water if our well has run dry. But um, those are needs that people in our community have, and, and the library meets those needs for, for those that have them. Um, so, I, a constant, an ever-changing, uh, dynamic constant is how I would answer mm -hmm. the question, what is a library? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think it's a good question. It's a great question. <laughs> I think it's a great question. So, yeah, I got from the Barnard College Library. Mm -hmm. um, so, What's a library to you? David Clark, tell us, what's a library to you? <laughs> Don't pick on me first. Uh, no, no, no. Well, I, you know, the, my takeaway from all this is that everybody has a different expectation and it's very personal. Uh, thank you very much for, for sharing that. So I open it up to you. Q&A, if you want to ask the panelists some questions, you know, drill down a little bit, or if you want to describe you know, how you met your spouse at the library and that's what it could be on a street dating or something, you know, whatever. So, um, it's a planted question. Yes, <laughs> maybe, maybe so. Uh, so, obviously we've had this discussion a million times over the last 40 years. Um, this is my husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the one that keeps, um, Keeping up in my mind is when you were at. I don't know what the, uh, we went. We went to Europe and we. You went to that library. Thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Salzburg um, Seminary. Yeah, and you met somebody from Ireland that oh, yeah. they had. Um, you know, they, they had a difficult time where they were fighting amongst each other, yeah. and their library decided that they needed to go out and capture those moments yeah. to, to document what was happening. Yeah. So they weren't serving the public, but they were they were providing, they were seeking out the information so that they could serve them yeah. later. And I, and I always thought that that yeah. was this, that this remarkable This woman was thing. unbelievable. She, she was, um, young. we were all young, younger then, I don't know. But, um, th it was when all the trouble was going on in Dublin, and there was the Protestants, and the, you know, the, there was gunshots. I mean, it was dangerous. It was like war zone. And they, the library director said, "We have to pick up these brochures and these, you know, little books that were being passed out, the propaganda, so that we have a record of it." And she said she went in places scared to death just to get all this stuff. But yeah, that was a very different take on the role of the library to record the history of the town. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, Grace and Kathy, you both sort of started your remarks by talking about your childhood and, and, and essentially what, what libraries were like when you were young. Um, this library is building is just about 100 years old. And we're trying to think about the future. So I'm especially curious, 
happy with your uh, vocation of visiting uh, <laughs> libraries on, you know, on vacation and so on. You must have seen some really cool things. Uh, tell us about some really interesting aspects of libraries that you have seen, and where do you? I, I, don't, I think a hundred years out is kind of hard to predict what libraries are going to be like. But what, where do, how do you see libraries changing to meet needs in the future, and, and how should a you know, a library building be changing to accommodate that? That's a great question. I, I think that when I visit libraries, the ones that seem the most successful are the ones that have adapted the best. So I feel like the feature of adaptability is really important. And um, I've been involved in planning some renovations, and I've, I've come to a couple of renovations that were already in progress. And the one piece of advice I have for anybody renovating anything is not to attach the shelves to the floor. <laughs> that is like, because I have found when they put the shelves in the wrong direction in your library, you can never fix the shelves. If you can't see that area, you really just will never see that area. But then also over time, the way that somebody designs a space may work really well for the staff member who designed it, and maybe even those teenagers or those kids or those adults who used that space initially. The people who planned it will really like the space. But 10 years later, there may be a, a different need. So the more that things are like built in, aside from maybe perimeter shelving, I feel like that the less adaptable the library is. So if the other thing I've noticed is over time, we had a tendency to probably pack a lot of books into libraries. So if you go back 100 years and look at a photo when the library opened, it's often got perimeter shelves and then a lot of reader tables in the middle. We're almost back 100, and 100 years, 120 years ago with what makes sense for some of the design of library spaces because we see a lot of people wanting to, we see more people coming in than can sit. Um, it's, mm. The library is like the cafe where you don't have to buy your coffee. So I, it, it's different in every community, but you really have to balance how much of the space you want to dedicate to collections and have leave the people in the future a little bit of room to change their minds. Because if you want to fit a maker space into a library in the future, but the shelving is all mm. bolted down, that's a major renovation. So I don't know, did I answer yeah. that? Sure. It's kind of a non-answer though, because I didn't say what will necessarily happen, just the, the adaptability, building that in is important. And I think too, even things like the flooring and the access to electricity, like we never would have put so many outlets as we need in an airport when, you know, if we built an airport in the 1980s, we never would have envisioned like everybody's got one of these and it's out of juice all the time. So thinking about the future, really we have to think about how might they be using the resources in the building and what might be important. I mean, now we know we should have more sinks in public spaces, right? We didn't know that three years ago, but now we would put more sinks in libraries. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm proud to be Grace's mom. Oh. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you to all the friends of our library. I remember being eight and reading the Diary of Anne Frank and just being so profoundly impacted, like trying to understand how people could do that to one another. And I remember my mom, we also went to the library every week and my mom brought me and I, I think that year I took out every book I could to understand the Holocaust and so for me a library is a place of understanding and compassion and similar to Grace Sanctuary in that it brings peace and presence and connection. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm really that I spent a lot of time in the library. So my question is about community building. And I think that was mentioned a few times how important it is to have an open space, everybody can come, 
and build community if they want to. But I'm most, always asking myself, who are the people who are not coming? You know, how can we open up the space to non-readers, to, I mean, whoever we don't see? And um, that is definitely an aspect that, you know, even when we build a new building, is important to bring into this way of it. Mm. And I love libraries, so <laughs> I'm really invested, you know, in my home library as well. Yeah, I, I, I'll speak a little bit to that, but, uh, you know, kudos to Dana because when I was talking with the staff, they said, you know, getting out of the library is just as important as staying in the library. You know, taking programs out. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of those libraries that I worked in was in Sheridan, Colorado, which is a little suburb of Denver. And it was a combined high school public library. And it was in a very high, Hispanic community, very low education. And somebody had gotten a grant and they had Spanish books on the shelf, but they were like Moby Dick. <laughs> or, you know, uh, you know, the Diary of Anne Frank in Spanish. You know, these people, they needed to know, you know, how do you, how do you buy a car, or, you know, help me. So we took the programs to uh, the, the agencies. Uh, we took the books. And I, and I think that's exactly, you know, Trisha on her bicycle going out to the, to the lunches at the, are hugely important. And I think, I mean, I've seen it happen. It, it makes for a whole community. You don't have to be in a building to, to benefit from the library. I, I would say that I have a pretty high standard for us. And my standard would be that Anytime any member of our community drives by or walks by or thinks about this place, they think of something that connects to their lives, something that they can do, some place, some friend that they met, some discovery they met, some community they built, something they, they designed together. And I think that's a high aspiration, but I don't think it's wrong to aim for that. And if we, if we seek to uh, reimagine space in any way, I think the dialogue we develop with all the people who would be going in and out and coming by is going to be critical because it's their resources that we're going to be asking for to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. And they have every right to have input, in my opinion, and every right to have be co-designers with this if it's to be an authentic uh, community endeavor. And why wouldn't it be? When I was a kid, we had bookmobiles. <laughs> And, and that was a wonderful thing. We knew the schedule. On Monday, they were going to be in this neighborhood. On Tuesday, they were going to be in that neighborhood. And kids would line up and wait for the bookmobile to come around. And so it was a great way to put the library really, truly out in the community because there it was on your street on a certain day of the week. Yeah, I just want to add, um, as Barbara mentioned, the, we get to do a lot of outreach here. And we have librarians that... Um, that go to um, the Parent Child Center for outreach right. programming and the Charter House. Uh, and a lot of what they're doing is just trying to, to help people feel that the library is a space for them and that they are welcome. Um, and, and I have to say, it's a real credit to the Middlebury community and the library trustees and the select board that we have the staffing to do that. Um, I'm sure Kathy and Tom could tell you that many, many public libraries in Vermont don't have adequate staffing to go out into the community, and it's so important. So. Thank you to the friends and the trustees and the select board uh, because we do get to do that and it's really fantastic. If I can share too on this, this is such a, an important topic, doing outreach, and it's great to hear the amazing job that folks here at the Ilse Library are doing. One thing that can be hard for us, um, or hard for me as a librarian, I want to go out and tell everybody about what I'm doing already. But what I'm doing already didn't get that person to come in. Right. Mm -hmm. They really didn't come. Like the library was doing it. We were nailing it. We were doing all of our library stuff. We were holding the book clubs. We were, I, I don't know. We were doing all the things that we were thinking of. Mm. I found it really interesting to go to people and ask them, what would you like us to do? I had some a seventh grade class that was, I used to do a lot of book talks. I'd show up and I'd talk for like half an hour and lose my voice by the end of the day and just share books with all these little kids. And there was a class that was, the teacher told me going in, these kids don't read. You're gonna have a really hard time. So instead of talking to them about the books and selling them on the books, I just said, tell me why you don't come to the library. 
And it was a lot of, you know, you do kind of dorky things or something for us. And I was like, okay, well, what do you want us to do? And this one little boy, he raised his hand and he was like, I would come for cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there like, okay, I'm gluten free. I'm not going to bake you a cookie. What are you, what are you doing? And so I said, tell me more. And he got kind of teary-eyed. This was kind of a tough class. And he got kind of teary-eyed. And he's like, well, we're not cute anymore. You might have noticed. We have pimples now. And our moms don't bake us cookies. And if you baked cookies or brought us cookies, we would come in. So we developed this whole program around cookies. And all these kids, because I said to them, if I do the cookie thing, you're going to come in. Like, each of you 30 kids are going to come in. And they did. They signed up for summer reading. Every week, we did a cookie for a book review. So they had to keep reading books. So I got what I wanted, which was that they came to the library and that they read some books and developed a relationship with the library, and they got their cookie. It worked for everybody. So I think sometimes we don't expect what they come out with, but we, I like going with it, you know, like try it out. Kathy? I would also say that I appreciate the library staff effort to do more than just library. I would do the library. They have beautiful artwork on display. They have a cribbage group. They have Drop and bridge, they have puzzles, that, that all these different ways get in the community in. I mean, if you have non readers, they want to be comfortable doing something else. There's so much else that the library offers other than just books. And I think that's a, 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 that's a lot about this library, that they work hard to bring the community together. Well, I think this is step one in listening to the community. And, and, uh, you know, opening the let's let's hear what you expect. You know, so be at this point in our development. Yeah, David. Um, just just a, a thought about um, the role the technology and Kathy had mentioned about uh, information, and I think you know uh, we've we've heard politicians who talk about fake news, and what is news? What is real? What is not? With everybody who has technology, they have they have cell phones. They can look up. Why do, I come to, why do I need to come to a library to look up something? Because I can just Google it right here. I think the libraries need to you know, communicate and, and help people with those decisions, with those, an outlook on, on what, what reality is. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a social issue that, that I think is so serious with technology and how you can be led down so many endless, endless paths uh, to, to nothing and a lot of wasted time out there, and a lot of wasted minds. <clears throat> okay, last words. The food is out. <laughs> um, please enjoy some food. Talk to your, your, each other about what you, your memories of uh, uh, libraries have been. I, Jimmy brought, my husband was a bookmobile driver. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was a quite an experience. <laughs> we'll, we'll chat about that later. Well, right? okay. yeah. Anyway, help yourself to some books. goodies over there. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, keep the conversation going. What does the library mean to you? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.